Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. My guest today is Susan Singer Carter. She's a writer, director, producer, and actress who created the groundbreaking documentary, No Country for Old People. It's a cautionary tale, a call to action, and it's actually an expose that addresses the neglect, the abuse, and the greed in nursing homes. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, you can call me Susie. Susie? As, okay. I was going to yeah, ask if you like yeah, Susie. Susie. Susie is, okay. Like, from when I was in, in elementary school, uh-huh. they wrote, is Susan in class? I am here. <laughs> no, it's called Sue Susan, but thank you. It makes me feel very, uh, very, uh, I don't know, grown up. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah, uh, you know, the, the documentary that you just mentioned is, um, is still in production we're working I, on so it's like it's actually started out as as a film and now we're seeing that there's so much information that it has to be a, a, a docu-series it just has to be um they're just it's it's we're talking about 60 years of history of a broken system and so you know, Susan, I invited you here to share your story with us. It's a personal story filled with pain and grief where it should have been filled with joy and gratitude for having people there for your mother. Please tell us how this all started. And and so let's start there. Sure. So, you know, it's funny because joy and gratitude was what I I that was my, that's always been my mantra and my mission with anything, you know, we, life is, is a series of, of challenges that you hope, you know, everyone that you overcome makes you a better person, stronger and wiser and kinder, we hope, right? And when my mom was, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's 16 years ago before she died. And I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's at all. And so when as I learned, and my mom was was next to my daughter's one of my best friends in the world. And I loved I, one of my favorite people in the world. And I just thought, we're going to go through this journey together. And I'm going to learn it along with her and made as many mistakes as you can make along the way. And instead of getting depressed about it, I decided to embrace it and lean into it and find the joy. And so, which led me to making a film for five years ago called My Mom and the Girl with Valerie Harper, which was her last feature. It was her last, um, it was her last performance, which was just stunning. It's a gift to the world, actually. And um, she just, res- she just, she connected with the role, my mother's joie de vie and my mother's, you know, sense of wit and music and love of life, you know, and, and being a survivor and, and loving life. And so it was such a tour de force. And I really felt like at first, just do we need another Alzheimer's movie? Mm -hmm. And when I finished it and when I went out on the circuit, on the on the festival circuit and realized there's the response that we were getting, that I thought something that was so personal turned out to be so so uh relatable to everybody. Even in no matter what age, it's sort of a sort of, you know, it was like the universality of of detail. And um, and I realized how potent stories are. And so now that brings me up to last year when my mom was um going through was there's nothing short of hell in our nursing home system, which I had no idea, and most people don't know but until you're in it. And then when you're in it, you're playing whack-a-mole and you you're you're in survival mode and your cortisol is just thumping and you and you're just trying to survive and help the person that you love to survive or to at least have the best quality of whatever life they have left right well so if, let me ask you something so your mother was diagnosed with alzheimer's 16 years ago how long did you keep her home and i guess my question is was it did you have no choice did it get to a point that she needed to be um in assisted living or was it something that you felt you weren't capable of doing? How did that, how did it even get to the point where she was put that's into assisted that's living? That's a whole nother story, but uh-huh. you know, my mom, when the, the movie that I made, My Mom and the Girl was based on the year that my mom lived with me, which was right after my stepdad died. And my mom, that was her best friend was having, you know, Groundhog's Day, where's Georgie? Mommy, he passed, what? What? 
you tell me, you know, and I just, my heart was breaking for her. I thought I have to walk her over this bridge, right? Because, and I knew that she would finally get it because as, as I've learned since with Alzheimer's, things that are important will eventually stick. And it stuck. It took it took a couple of weeks till she finally went, where is he? And I looked at her and she said, he died. Yes, mommy, he died. So, but, you know, then it gets complicated because ageism, ableism and family members who don't understand it. And my in my own sibling who was like, you know, why is she living with you? And, and it's, it, you know, didn't know anything about the economics of it, didn't know anything about the disease and and had control of her money and so he was like why she should be in a place where you know she's taken care of and you know long story but I was my hand was pushed and we put her into the best place we thought was the best place you know and then what happens is, is that eventually when you have a disease that long but like you know it is a very long exit for some people you 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 spend down your money you right. just you and that's when she, you know, she went into a nursing home. She didn't really, she ended up in a nursing home. And that's, this is a whole nother story because of, of chemical restraining, which they do often with people with dementia because it's easier. So they will, my mother was, was, they were giving her Depakote, which is an antipsychotic without, I had no idea. I thought that her Alzheimer's had progressed, but no I discovered through her regular doctor that, you know, your mom is on a black label drug called Depakote. And this is why she's like a zombie. And that and was only to help them. That was only to help the caretakers not have to deal with what her needs were. Exactly. And not understanding the disease, not understanding that when you put somebody that what my mom was healthy as could be physically, mm -hmm. this all happened within a couple of weeks of me moving in, her into a memory care facility in Los Angeles. And you know, I thought, oh my God, she's so progressed. And then I found out it was the Depakote. And that was when she lost her ability to walk. She's walking five miles a day with us. You know, she was in tip top shape because most people don't understand that when you put somebody with Alzheimer's in a new surroundings where you have nothing familiar, there's no touchstone. You're going to get anxious. You're going to get anxious. You're going to say, I want to go home. Get me the hell out of here. This is not my home. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. <laughs> Where am I? You know? Did you? So that transition is interesting to me. Did you move her things in, try to replicate her? Yeah. If, but but there are, but uh, uh, even though the patient has dementia or Alzheimer's, they're aware of the fact that it's not their home. You could hang the pictures and all that, but there's an awareness that it's not yeah. home. Yeah. It's not home. Yeah. Not, and there's nobody there you know. Right. There's no touchstone. There's nobody to say, there's nobody to redirect you in a way that says, oh, mom, by the way, I just spoke to, you know, your best friend, T Terry. She's coming to over. We're going to all have, there's no way to get her into her long-term memory mm -hmm. as much. And that's where you, that's where you can open the doors. That's why music is so good. How long into the process of having put it put her there and uh, it, and it obviously started to unravel how long did it take you to really see what a disaster this was was, was it bits at a time or cuz it sounds like her decline was rapid it was rapid it was you know and i think that this is this is why the timing for this documentary is so so good because COVID pulled the curtain back on what was all, what was really going on. So all the times that I would go to the facility and think, wow, this is like cuckoo's nest. And this is like a really expensive place. And it's really, you know, and there was all kinds of, you know, Hollywood royalty was there. Right. And everyone's walking around, like just, it was so crowded and so, so disorganized and frenetic. And, and I thought, I didn't know the culture of nurse of, you know, assisted living or memory care. So you just think, well, this is it. You listen to the experts and you go, but something inside of you goes, this is wrong. Something's wrong. And then during COVID, when we were restricted, this is after my mom moved into the nursing home, we were restricted and, and we finally were able to zoom, which is not the greatest with someone with dementia to get them to focus right um 
everybody, everybody rapidly declined during COVID because everybody was isolated. But I would, I noticed pretty quickly that our three, once a week, three o'clock appointment, mom was in bed instead of in her chair. She wasn't bed bound. And suddenly oh. she's not dressed. She's in bed. She's sleepy. She's not really responding. So, and, and so many of the, of the, the residents that I had, you know, we'd go at least once or twice a week and always you know spend hours there and have I knew all of the the people on her floor and you know it was like a little party we'd sing we'd dance we'd do everything and all of the people that were very you know cognitively healthy just older passed away from isolation right isolation is deadly isolation is horrible Loneliness, so, the new smoking, as they say, right? It it oh, just it's terrible. So this is another question, if you can answer for me, is during COVID, looking back, knowing what we know now, you could have gone there with a mask, or they could have taken her outside, and you could have had physical visits. In retrospect, we know that now. They wouldn't have though, and they, they wouldn't let anybody in. They were they. You know, there was this this, you know, facade of protocol that 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 varied from facility to facility. Right. So they wouldn't even allow window visits. And um, and I was I was it was bizarre. Like you would you know, and when my mom was, is in the hospital during covid, you, I would walk in with a, you know, an N95 and they'd say, we need you to take your mask off and put our, I put one on. It was just one of those little thin masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was like the, the protocol was just so inconsistent. And that was the same way, even at my mom's facility, once she got out and she now had gone into hospice and, you know, every time I would come, if it was during the day, you'd have to sign in, you'd have to show your vaccinations, they take your temperature. If you got there after five, <laughs> all bets are off. Just walk right in. That's unbelievable. Know? Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. What yeah. were some of the mishaps that happened that that led to more serious implications for your mother? What you know, what what was a uh, besides, I mean, obviously instinctually you knew something wasn't right here. What were well, the big things going on that that were alerting you to probably a lot, but uh, a lot. Well, yeah. well, it all happens very quickly, right? So, you know, last year it was a, it was really a very poetic time period. It was a sick. Sorry, my editor's uh, day is ringing. Sorry. Okay, it's done. Um, it was it was still during it was during Omicron, and and I had gone to visit my mom, and at this point they had they were allowing people outside visits okay. and they wheeled my mom out my man my partner who's my best friend who is producing this project with me was there and we always take you know videos and pictures for poster posterity that's it mm -hmm. and um for some reason he he was finding this this afternoon very intriguing because I was doing the story of mom and trying to keep her happy you know and you know getting into her past like you know in this whole story, like you might have you might have heard of her. This is my mom. She was doing opera at nine. Yeah, she was that, you know, never did the whole story. She's laughing, she's loving it. And um, and then I noticed that she had someone else's teeth in her mouth. And oh. um, yeah, and, and they were dirty. And my mom didn't wear bridges. She had like a couple teeth that she had the clip up, but they didn't use them anymore. And she didn't look clean. She didn't look dehydrated. She looked dehydrated. She was, she's very responsive, but I, I knew there was something off and I wheeled her back into the charge nurse. And I said, you know, my mom's got someone's bridge in her mouth. And she said, oh, that's impossible. And I said, well, take a look. And when she looked, she said, oh my God, give me those. And then she said, it had to be the temp nurse. Well, that's the first time I'd ever heard that the temp nurse. I never heard that. And you know, 36 hours later, my mom was rushed to the hospital with a stage four pressure sore, stage four, that's to the bone, dehydrated, low kidney function, 10%, sepsis, pneumonia, and on and on and on. That's unbelievable. That's outrageous. That's beyond, I my heart goes out to you, the pain you must have been feeling. It's not one thing you got bombarded, you have an avalanche, an earthquake hit you. Yeah. And then you have the, the, you have the system 
that you're up against now. And the system is going, you're calling and saying, how is this happening? My mom was just, and, and the hospital made sure to tell me that she w- had been admitted with the wound because a wound is a never event. Right, so right. Never right. event. Your loved one should never get a stage four wound ever. That is a never event. That is neglect. And so um, they wanted to make sure that it was not their responsibility. So when I called the the facility and said, my mom, this is what's going on. When did it, why wasn't this addressed? And why wasn't I told, oh, it didn't happen here. And so the gaslighting begins. Yes. Yeah. Did the hospital go to bat for you and say there's something wrong here? There's trouble in paradise. Not at all. In fact, they kept saying, where's your mom at? And I would say she's at the bloody blah. And they'd go, what? Because it's one of the most beloved, you know, Mm -hmm. facilities. You guys can work it out and figure out what it is. But, you know, it's a beloved facility. And they were like, we're shocked. We're shocked. We're shocked. And, you know, and I said, me too, me too, because I would say on my podcast, because I, I have a podcast, Love Conquers Alls, and I would say, I can, I'm so happy that my mom is at this place. I yeah. can sleep at night. I can sleep because I know that she is well taken care of. I had no clue, zero clue what was going on. You know, it was, it it's, it's extraordinary. And then, it, you know, and you'll see when you see that documentary, I can't make up what happened and it it was and you know I'm Pollyanna like I don't look for trouble that's not my that's not my thing I don't like to complain I it's not my issue that's not what I like to do I have the disease to please right so I'm not I'm not going in like a bull out of the china but I was like what is going on like if it's not one thing it's another it was this it was that and 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 suddenly now you're feeling like you're unhinged because it was you going you know, your mom is going to be fine. She's probably going to die from the wound, but you know, she's 89, you know, she's 89. And, and that just is so infuriating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When you're 89, I want to say that to you Mm -hmm. while you're still loving your life. My mom wasn't ready to die. And I told them that I said, my mom will, I'll know. I will know. You know, and and then the list goes on. Then they ended up putting her on MPO. Why did they put her on MPO? Let's tell audience. the audience what that means. Right. That means That's no- nothing by the mouth. Nothing, nothing by the mouth. Yes. Mm-hmm. And what they do that for, for the, mo- you know, sometimes there are reasons to be on MPO. There's very, very, very few reasons why anybody should be on MPO. It is the worst thing you could do to anybody. Think about never eating or drinking. Right. day in and day out day in and day out it's and especially for someone who's elderly and who has dementia because that is such a joy mm-hmm. eating, eating is a joy eating is part of our lives not to mention just the physical uh, you know repercussions of not having anything orally it is awful so she had no swallowing issues she had relatively good teeth and she understood she could still understand how to eat and yeah. they still pulled it from her. They said she was going to, she was aspirating. And I said, but do you need to take, have you done, you know, have you done a uh, speech pathologist? Has that, yes. that again, a speech pathologist come in and do an assessment, a swallow assessment. We'll look into it. But we're, you know, we're, listen, there's a thing called silent aspiration where, and your mom could very easily be, you know, silently aspirating. Well, meantime, they put her on a G tube, which was supposed to be temporary because she was intubated because of all of the things that happened when I told you previously, um, which was all obviously temporary. And once, when she was extubated, when she was released, and this is the other issue, when, when, a, when someone who doesn't have an advocate in the hospital with them, like a child or like an an elderly person who has dementia and can't advocate for themselves or any of us who have been intubated for a week, none of us could talk afterwards. It's right. very difficult to talk. And by the way, swallow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So instead of rehabilitating her, they left the G-tube in because once they're, they're released, it's, it's off the hospital's hands. Now it's in, and of course to the nursing home, it's easier. They don't have to help feed her. It's yeah, they just can funny. leave her there to lie fallow. It's terrible. It's Susie, terrible. Susie, I understand the 
mainstream media will just say it's staff sh shortages, right? They'll say, well, we're understaffed and nobody me means to neglect. We just don't have it. You know, they're using that as the root cause of problems. But what about all the times they just don't follow orders? Exactly what you're saying. Protocol, patients' wishes, a DNR, which uh, for our audiences do not resuscitate. There are people that have situations they do not want to be resuscitated, or they have situations where they want to be resuscitated. Right, right. And all the other patient requests that are not followed. Right. Well, that's a good question. The thing is, is that it is at the root of all these, this problem is staffing. Understaffing is the root of all the problems. However, it is not because of lack of money. There's plenty of money. It's that our facilities and our nursing homes have been taken over by private equity you know, organizations and corporations. And so they're answering to profit over people as opposed to people over profit. And they're, and because they are private equity, there's no transparency in their booking, bookkeeping. Most, most of the times we don't know even who the, the corporate owner is because they don't have to, they don't have to disclose that. So there's no trail as to where the money is being, you know, if you say follow the money, well, where is it going? Right. right. But the money is basically, you know, the whole business is based on a, an extractive business model. So they're getting reimbursed from CMS, from Medicare and Medicaid. And all that money that is meant to be spent on you or your loved one is not because they're cutting corners, because they're answering to their higher ups. And then the business model also includes related parties, which means those corporations now have bought the real estate. They've now bought the vendors. They've now bought the management company. And so they're paying themselves and jacking up the prices and saying, we don't have enough money to staff because our rent's too high. It's insane. Susie, you share in the documentary that the assisted living facility was supposed to put your mother in rehab, but instead put her in hospice. How did that happen? Because people, because most of us don't know about how hospice is big business, for one thing. Hospice I didn't know that. The most, yeah, it's the most lucrative of all of our government, you know, of the of that program, of CMS's program, and and which is Medicare and Medicaid. They pay the highest. So we're talking about anywhere between low end $800 a day for someone in hospice to $1,500 a day. So Is that hospice yeah. unit within the facility or she had to be physically moved to somewhere else? No, it was within. It oh, was, that's yeah. convenient for them. So now they're getting another bed and they get twice the amount of money. That's and they don't have to do anything. Right. So it's really, it's really advantageous for the facility to put somebody, push them into hospice because they're still now considered long-term care. They're mm -hmm. getting reimbursed by Medicaid, Medicaid or Medicare, depending on where the person's at. And, and they're also, and then, the, but they don't have to take care of them because the hospice company has come in now to take that team is taking care of them. But because hospice is, is, is so murky and nobody really knows what do they cover? What do they don't cover? How long does it last? You know, da, 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 da. So mostly it's like, let's just keep them comfortable. And that's, that's a euphemism for let's give them morphine. Let's give them some Haldol. Let's just keep them quiet. And by the way, they're aspirating. So let's not feed or give them any right. food. And then uh, they blame, they they blame the, right. And they blame the death on age or pre-existing conditions, et cetera. Exactly. Susie, how much time did you spend getting the staff to abide by the rules? A, like going in and saying, my mom needs this, my mom. And where the hell are the doctors? They are not existent. They're not existent. They, the hospice doctor, I don't think she ever saw my mom. She was making decisions on the phone to me. She, she said to me on the phone, I recommend you taking turning off the tube, the G tube, and let's just keep your mom comfortable. And I said, my mom, because I was going in and, and they would, they finally acquiesced to let me allow, allowed me to let her suck on one of those oral sponges, mm -hmm. right? And, and, um, because I said, she's drinking, she's swallowing, she's only coming alive when I come in with some juice. And I said, and I will come every day if you don't do it. I will come every day. And guess what? I was there every day for six months. Because they refused and they actually said, 
you can take her home if you feel uncomfortable. And I said, you know, that's impossible now in the state that she's in because of the lack of care that she received from you. Um, uh, and, and were you, were you, uh, you know, where did that leave you as a patient advocate? Did, you know, did the facility acknowledge in any way, shape or form they were falling short? They try to correct mistakes never, or at the never, very least apologize? Never, Nothing. never, 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 never. It was always, if something horrible happened, which many horrible things happened, and and I would make them aware, but they'd say, thank you so much for making us aware. You know, that's a training issue. We're going to look into that. In your one of your clips, because I, I, I reviewed all of them when, because I'm so on your side here and I want to do anything I can to help you get this word out. There was a young lady, a nurse or a nursing assistant who said, you know, we're up against a wall. So were there any employees that you were able to get information of from about what really is going on that said, listen, I'm doing the best I can to help? Was there like maybe a staff member that enlightened you to what was going on in there? Not none, none of the staff members. There was when my mom, the, after three hospital visits and she got and she came back, this was like she still had a Foley catheter after four months and I was like my mother doesn't need please take this out it is just you know it's your this is the no one should have a fully catheter for four months. Yeah, yeah. For, and they kept saying in a, the hospice uh the head uh, administrator said called me and said I want you to know my father had a fully catheter for two years it's absolutely safe and don't you know like like Murphy's Law two days later my mom was hemorrhaging from her urethra and they had to give her blood transfusions and she had to almost died from that. So who alerted, after, who alerted them to the fact that she was in an emergency situation? Were you there or did somebody? No, find they you? called, they called me and said, this is what they said. Your mom, first they thought she had a, that they said, you know, your mom has got some Brown co coming into her, uh, what do you call urine. it? The urine mm -hmm. bag, whatever it's called, the receptacle. Right. And, and they said, but we don't think it's a, a, a bladder infection because she doesn't have a fever. And I said, okay. So that day I went to see her and she was very lethargic and I knew that she was out of it. I said, I think she has a bladder infection. Well, we're, we sent it out to the lab. We did a stat on it and, and the nurse had forgot to call the right lab. So it was like another 12 hours before the, we got the results back, got the results back. Sure enough, she had a bladder infection. So I... As I went, I went to visit her, she was very, very lethargic. Before I even got home, I got a call that she was hemorrhaging. What do you want us to do? And I said, what do you mean, what do I want you to do? Is she bleed? Is she hemorrhaging? The yes, then call 911. Right. Right. And so they never apologized for that, ever. And, you know, that that was when I got my mom the doctor there who actually said, your mom, there's no reason for her to be on MPO. She should have oral gratification. That's ridiculous. And I'm going to order it. They still wouldn't do it. And they, he finally got her off of the, the uh, catheter. He said this, she does not need it. And, um, she, and he said, and the reason why all of this is happening probably is because she's in hospice. And so they're just ignoring her. So let's put her into palliative. And she'll start getting some care because they won't even call a wound doctor. It's unbelievable. I can't even believe I'm hearing this. So it's it's unreal what happened. And and so when and and that's the other thing that I wanted that I'm trying to explain in our documentary is what's the difference between hospice and palliative? Palliative is an umbrella, but there are programs that 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 you can bill to that are under the palliative umbrella, which are not under just regular Medicare or Medicaid, Medical in California. So it is, and, and the experts find it confusing. So let alone the, you know, us regular folk who don't, aren't in the medical field. And we're trying to navigate this, like, all these twists and turns and things that even the experts don't understand. And so you're looking for somebody to tell you the truth. Like, give, just give me the answer. Help me help my mom. That's all I want. I don't know what I'm doing. Which is even doubly astounding that you were there. I'm sure there's patients that don't have people advocating for them. Oh, you were there saying just, I'm here. I'll do it. Just what did it, what is it I need to do? 
Susie, what recourse does the family have legally when patients are neglected? That's that's another very, very, very frustrating issue because most, because everything is, is regulated by state by state and every state has different caps, even, you know, on death. So for wrongful death, you know, like California's was their cap up until last the end December of last year was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that means if somebody dies, you could be completely neglected. You could make someone suffer. They could have the worst exit of their of you know that you've ever seen. God forbid. And if you got to court, and if you found somebody who will take your case because it's expensive, and, and nobody all, wants to go up against them, yeah, that that's nobody wants to go, right. especially. The beloved, where my mom was at, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, and and for two hundred fifty thousand right. dollars, right? So it's gone up a, a percentage this last year, but still, it has to be you know a a lawyer has to really think that you've got a a, a solid foolproof case, and even then, at the end of the day, these companies look at those fines as just the cost of doing business. Right. They they allow for it in there. So you know, I, I, when we did the little bit of the pre-interview and we were talking, I didn't I didn't have this in here, but I want to ask you this if you if you can even answer this. What is the morale of the staff when you go? Do they run the other way when they see you? Do they say there's not, you know, people who somebody has to have an ounce of of compassion in them. I, I I can't, you know, I, I know it's a ghost town. I've been to them. I understand. And we went through a few things with my parents, but that little glimmer of, is there anything left in, in, in taking what, like, what is the thought? Well, the person's old. We don't care. Is it a triage? Well, they're 89. I'm not going to help them. Well, he's only 80. Maybe we should help him. She's mm-hmm. only 75. Let's pay a little more attention. What's right. the thinking? Right. Correct. You're correct and all that. And and people, you know, listen, there's been an exodus of people from the from this industry, right? And there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, uh army of, of healthcare providers who have experienced and are suffering with moral moral injury, right? Because right. they can't do the job that they set out to do that they'd always wanted to do, and because they're really being shackled by an industry. And the industry says this is the way you have to do it. This is this is what we need to you know bill for. We need this. We need that. Everything you know, and and so many people are leaving a because they're underpaid for one thing, mm-hmm. underpaid, overworked, and and you know there's there's very few. I don't even know if they exist anymore. You know, independent providers. They're all, they're all under a huge umbrella, so they have they have stockholders to answer to, right? And so. It's it's very difficult, and when you do have someone compassionate, and I'm not saying there were some com- compassionate frontline providers that were at the facility who would take me aside and say, "I would do exactly what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I would do exactly what you're doing," but they couldn't help me because their job was on the line. Right. They're not going to risk that for you. Right. I mean, I had the charge nurse the night, the the week before my mom died. My mom was in the hospital and she said to me, and we both cried. She said, you're, the, you're an amazing daughter. It'll make me cry now if I say it. Uh-huh. But she uh-huh. said, you're an amazing daughter. I hope that my daughter's like you. And she said, but you don't bring her back here. Please don't bring her back here. They know, they know, and they tell you. Susie, you made this amazing, painful, and shocking documentary on what really goes on in assisted living facilities leaving families and in some cases, staff members, like we just discussed, devastated and demoralized. What can we do as a society to change this? So listen, that's a huge question. And I'm work- we've been working so closely with the National Consumer Voice for Quality mm-hmm. Long-Term Care, who by the way, have been around since 1975. That's how long this goes yeah. on, right? The same issues, it, it hasn't changed, hasn't changed so sadly, it hasn't changed. And one of the things we were discussing just last week was what what is the call to action? Like, what can we do? You know, the, these traditional the traditional paths of of advocacy, writing your legislature, writing bills, getting you know this and that. Yeah, they can they can move the needle a tiny bit, but they're never going to make they're never going to 
change and make the shift that we're looking for. We need a complete, you know, we need to tear it down and rebuild it because it's, it's, it's been this way for too long and nobody is incentivized. And um, I think what's really important for the audience to know is that there is a, a nursing home lobby mm-hmm. that is so powerful and, and possibly more powerful than the pharmaceutical. And my partner on this project is Rick Moncastle, who is a former attorney general and, and federal prosecutor who was the subject of Hulu's uh, dope sick. He was oh, the oh really oh okay and he also prosecuted nursing homes for 25 years and never saw any change because the one by one prosecutions which never are they're always civil they're never criminal even though it, they're killing people and he just said now you know he he retired last year and he said now I can make change and so well, you know, his background hopefully what he can bring obviously is is the reality of what goes on in years and years of experience absolutely and, and and the fact that, that the nursing home lobby is that strong so our politicians are bought and paid for and so are our bills and so is the enforcement or lack thereof of and of bills so even if a bill passes who's enforcing it where right. where's the oversight I, you know, and and the the interesting thing is I was just having this discussion with someone today because um, my new book coming out is called It's Okay to Be Old, and it's about what is old and how do we define it. And one of the things, the living generations now, I did a tremendous amount of research and it, 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 what it used to be, and not in the far too, you know, not not too long ago, in the, in the recent past, I might add, you retired at 65. That's when you got your pension, your social security, whatever. And most right. people didn't live past 70 or 75. So right. golden years were two years, three years, five years max. Right. And we have a whole different model now. And obviously the government hasn't caught up. So what it what's so important for everybody now that what I'm telling people is you really got to get it together in your 50s. You can't wait until you're in your 70s to figure this out. In your 50s is the time to start saying, well, what if I live to be 85? What if I live to be 95? What if I live to be 100? What is it we can do? Whether it's putting money away, advocating for yourself, or being that big mouth that goes and fights fights for for the rights of people that are aging. So I, age I love what you're doing. Time. Right. Ageism plays a huge role. A huge role. Huge role. And I need, don't yeah, we we need to collect that team. nut. Yes. We have to do a, a public socially, you know, a social shift is what we yes. need. Because yes. if we don't get that, this this, you know, that's what's keeping the system status quo. Because people don't, for the most part, don't look at that that chapter of life that you're That's talking right. about right. and so because it's it's the other it's others well this isn't my mom's story this is all of our story it's mine it's yours it's your parents it's your children's story so it's everybody's story and it happens quicker than you know absolutely and, absolutely and, and do you you know i'm telling you right now you do not want to go in a nursing home you do not want to go in a nursing home it is, it is not, it is warehousing. And, you know, so, so how do we fix it? We need to, we are the only currency as mm-hmm. human beings. Mm-hmm. We are the currency and we need to be able to use, use the power that we have as constituents to say, we are up, we know what you're doing. We're not going to vote for you. Right. We're aware of what the system is. We know it has to be a Me Too movement. It has to be a Black Lives Matter movement. It has to be, you know, boots on the ground. We see you. We know what's happening, Governor. <laughs> we know what you're doing. And, you know, especially with people that are ambitious, they're going to they're going to listen to that. They're not going to listen to a bill. Right. That comes across their desk that they're not paying attention to, you they're know. Not- your care. You know, Susan, there's another, and I don't know if you've been following these stories about the ageism among the politicians that now they're using this as am- the, a person's age as ammunition against them, not as much as a, um, a a policy or a belief or whether you're left or right or blue or red. It's, well, that person needs to take a competency, competency test because now they're 75. 
That sets the stage for the audience to instantly think the person is incapable of running for office. It is just, it is so hard to fight that once that comes out of somebody's mouth or once that, and we're looking now and, you know, maybe 85 isn't the best time to be running for president or running for office, but just a few years younger than that, I know so many competent people traveling the world, doing fantastic things. So to just chalk them off due to age um, is, is a terrible problem we're having. Now, having said that, Susan, I say very strongly, 60 is not the new 40. If you're 60, you're no longer 40. If you're 50, you're no longer 30. So please take heed at the current age you are now and try to have some foresight into the future, even if you are 30 or 40 or 50, because I can only say only, only 50, because I'm 63. So <laughs> I like to say, you're only 50. Please, everybody, start paying attention now. I can't say that enough, because Susie and I can tell you these, it goes in a blink, you're 20, you're 40, and it, it happens so quickly. And to care for yourself, to care for others, and just keep coming from a place of compassion. Somebody who is lying in a hospital, a nursing home, a hospice, and does not have the capability to take care of themselves, we have a responsibility to make sure that they're okay. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes. So strongly. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, can I just add to your ageism conversation? Sure. Absolutely. You know, we, it, and I agree with you that, you know, 60 is not the new 40 and, and whatever. I don't, I, I kind of feel like let's throw all those boxes out because we're all individuals. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a better hip hop dancer than somebody than many people who are, you know, 30 years younger than me. That's yeah. okay. That's me. And I'm not going to, it's not, you know, that just happens to me, me, Susie. I'm not going to, you know, when my, when my body starts getting, feeling bad, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. But I, I plan to be active as long as I can. And I don't really like the boxes. I just think we are, we're alive. Absolutely. We are alive. I don't look at older people and think, that's an older person. I think that's a human being that I would want to either know or I don't want to know. That's right. You know? That's right. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I try to look at it that way because it's really a continuum. And I, I mean, I can look at I can look at my my granddaughters who are babies right now and go, I can see their life. I can see who they're going to be. You know, and 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 that's. I just feel like we're just. It's so lucky that we're here to share it, and that you know we stop stop defining everybody. Just live and enjoy right. just be here and let everybody let li let live and let live and yeah a hundred percent thank you so much Susie Susan Singer yeah. Carter my, <laughs> my new friend Susie for joining and sharing your very painful story and I hope this all helps and lastly Susie I always ask my guests what do you like about getting older oh I love I feel more I I know I hear this all the time but I feel so much more uh confident in in my skills of what I can do like as a writer I feel so much more uh confident in what I can do I feel more I feel less anxious about you know about things that aren't aren't important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and and I and and really got it I think I've got a handle on what is important and, you know, and that's so lovely. That's so freeing. And it's so wonderful that you're getting to spend time with your children and your grandchildren and being a part yeah. of their lives. It's amazing. And, yeah. and your wisdom and your age and coming before them is only going to help them. It's only going to, right. And it's going to open their minds even more to what they help me. I learned from them too. It's yeah, really such a lovely thing. It's very, you know, it's, it's the cycle of life. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So Susie, tell us where to get in touch with you and how to access the incredible wealth of information that you're providing here. Oh my gosh. Any on all the platforms, which I hate because there's too many, but it's, like, I, it's Susie Singer Carter. I'm on everywhere, Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and TikTok and X, whatever it is now. And, you know, I'm there and I have a website, which is um, Go Girl Media. 
Okay, Go Girl Media, www.gogirlmedia.com. So a lot of people like to have a, a Grand Central Station yeah. to go. So that, that yes. would help. And uh, Susan, I wish the best for you on this. I'm behind you 100%. And, um, you know, to be continued. I think we need to continue to talk about this. Yes. And if, can I just say one thing too? If you can, if you, we are still raising money for the finishing of this project, which is, you know, uh, we're nonprofit. We, everything is tax deductible. And you can go to my website or anywhere and get the link to the National Consumer Voice, who are our fiscal sponsor. They get a portion of it as well. And it'll help us complete the film and get it out more quickly because right now someone's suffering. Yeah, yeah. And we'll include that on the um, the caption when we when we post the show. So again, thank you again so much, Susie. Thank and you, thank, thank you all for listening. Please subscribe to my channel, Patricia Greenberg, for more engaging discussions on all things aging well. Thank you.